Well, in conjunction with our All Saints Day celebration today, we are also continuing our sermon series on the five things that God uses to grow our faith. And it was just last week that we talked about providential relationships, that God brings people into our lives to make an impact on our faith. And I think as we look over at this table today and we think about all these flickering lights, each one of them represents the life of someone who has impacted our faith for the better. We are who we are today because they were a part of our lives. And the week before last, we talked about practical teaching, which is where we learn how to take the truth that's in the Bible and put it into practice in our everyday lives. And so we talked about how obedience to God's word, doing that, putting that into practice, that in itself is an act of faith. And so when we step out in faith, over and over and over again, and that step of faith is met with God's faithfulness, that grows our faith. That grows our relationship with God. And so this week, we're going to be looking at private disciplines. Now, when you hear the word discipline, what immediately comes to mind? Parents yelling at you. you. All right, what else? What's that? Punishment. Punishment, yeah. Teaching of respect, okay? What else? Right, doing what you should do. Not necessarily what you want to do, but doing those things that you should do, right? Someone in the last service said spanking. Um, (laughs) I hope it's not that. But the original meaning of the word discipline actually meant instruction or teaching, And now in our society, when we hear it, it's become kind of a bad word because we associate it with doing those things that we know that we should be doing or we know that we ought to be doing, but not necessarily the things that we want to be doing. So what are some of those things that we ought to do that we don't necessarily like doing? Yeah. Doing chores. Yes. What else? Exercising, someone said homework. Exercising, homework, what else? What's that? Eating healthy, right? Okay, Halloween weekend, avoiding sugar, right? That, that was a hard discipline to keep this weekend for a lot of people, I think. What about getting up early? Maybe going to bed early? Picking up after yourself? Flossing? <laughs> right? It's not something we necessarily want to do, but we know we ought to do it. And if you talk to people who have been practicing a discipline for a particularly long time, sometimes what you hear them say is, you know, I used to really dread that. But, you know, now I actually kind of enjoy it. Anyone enjoy flossing? (laughs) Yeah, a couple people. Yeah, we had a couple of, like, yeah, enthusiastic flossers in the last service, too. So that's good. But for people who have done a discipline over and over and over again, it becomes more like a part of their lives. It's, it's a lifestyle. And so regardless of where we stand on that spectrum, when we think about a particular discipline, uh, maybe it's exercise or eating healthy or whatever it is, if, you know, from loathe to love, wherever you are on the spectrum, there are some things we know about discipline. And the first is that discipline results in freedom. Now, how many of people have ever created a budget and really, really tried to stick to that? You were being really disciplined and you weren't spending on things that were not in your budget. And, you just, and when you do that, if you've done that, what you discover is that it sets you free. It sets you free from debt and that weight that so many of us tend to carry around. And if you are diligent in, in picking up after yourself, putting things away after you're done using them, right? That is a discipline. What ends up happening? I mean, how many of us would feel this huge weight lifted off of us if all the clutter in our house were just to disappear? You know, yes, my husband raised this hymn last night. I was like, not fair. Um, But that leads me to a second observation about discipline, and that's that discipline results in progress. And it doesn't have to be something huge, it could be something as insignificant as attacking those piles of clutter for 15 minutes a day. And if you do that for 15 minutes a day, eventually you're going to notice a big difference. And finally, you know, 
we don't all, nobody really loves cleaning. I think we like having cleaned, but not cleaning. Um, what we learn about discipline is that discipline is beneficial regardless of your attitude. So regardless of whether or not you really feel like doing it, it's still good for you, right? Because if you go to the gym, you know, you are a gym goer, but every day when you wake up to go to the gym, you get dressed and you were like, oh, I wish I was in bed. This terrible, like, and you know, and you were like grumbling the whole time you're getting dressed, and then the whole time you're driving, you're like, like, looking like someone put sour milk in your coffee, and you, you know, and then you get to the gym, and you're on the elliptical, and you were like, this is terrible, I hate this, you know, and you're like, what is wrong with all these smiling people, because, you know, and you do that four days a week, week after week, isn't it still going to be beneficial? Yeah, it's still going to benefit you. And so keep those things in mind, because discipline doesn't have to be the bad word that we've made it out to be. In fact, when I was in seminary, I would go um, and visit one of my mentors, and in her office, she had a tiny little picture framed, and in that picture was a quote, and it said, discipline is remembering what you want. Discipline is remembering what you want. And that has stuck with me all these years. And, you know, I don't particularly enjoy going to the gym. Like, I'm not as bad as that person I just described. It's not quite that bad. But now that it's gotten cold and it's dark when I wake up in the morning, though this time change is really going to... It's going to benefit me some. Um, but, you know, it's cold and it's dark and my alarm goes off and I'm like in the middle of a dream and really all I want to do is turn the alarm off and just roll over and snuggle up next to my husband and forget about the gym. But you know what has yet to fail me? It's reminding myself that I want to be able to wake up next to him for a really long time. And I recognize that, you know, there's no guarantee that just by going to the gym X number of times a week, week after week, that we're going to have another 40 years together, another 50, 60, whatever it is. There's no guarantee of that. But I do know that going to the gym and being disciplined about caring for our physical health is certainly going to make that more likely. And so I've taught myself to remember what I really want. And as we sit here today, we are reminded the question that was asked of us at the very beginning of this whole sermon series, and that's, how many of us would love to have a stronger faith in God? You know, how many of us would love to have a deeper trust in God, to have such confidence in God and in God's goodness and God's faithfulness that when the storms of life come beating down upon us, we can still stand? I think all of us that first week said yes to that. That's what we want. And so if you ask any professional musician or professional athlete how it is that they got to where they are, they're going to talk to you a lot about discipline practice. And really, our faith is not much different. If you talk to someone who has a strong, thriving, exciting relationship with God, and you ask them how God grew them and what God used to grow them to that point, they're going to talk to you about spiritual disciplines. They might talk to you about when they started to have a prayer life, a personal devotional time. They might talk to you about journaling. They might talk to you about giving and, and how giving a percentage of their income has taught them to trust God. These disciplines, they're just like any other discipline, but they build our faith muscles. And so that over time, we'll find that our faith has gotten a lot stronger. And so the scripture that we looked at just a few minutes ago was in um, Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. Well, it was Jesus' sermon, but in the Gospel of Matthew. And we've been looking at it actually over the last couple weeks. And in this particular section of the Sermon on the Mount, what we hear Jesus doing is giving us some very practical instruction about three disciplines, or he called them acts of piety, that would have been a part of every early Jesus follower's life. And as you heard it read, um, I don't know if you picked up on this, but he, he actually, there's a pattern that he repeats as he's talking about each one. So if you've got your bulletin, um, go ahead and turn that over. If you've got a Bible, great, you know, turn to Matthew. But take a look at this scripture in the bulletin and see if you can find the patterns in what he's saying. Now, the first thing he does is he begins each instruction with the word, whenever. You know, whenever you give alms. 
whenever you pray, whenever you fast. And notice he doesn't say if, you know? <laughs> that's, that's convicting in itself. He doesn't say if, he says when. And so for Jesus, it's just an assumption that these things will be a part of our lives. Now, the second thing he does is he makes a statement that causes us to examine our motivation. You know, and I want to, right now I want to distinguish motivation from attitude. Motivation is about the reasons, the reasons why we do something versus whether or not we feel like doing it. And so what Jesus is basically saying is he's saying, don't practice these disciplines in such a way that, that people take notice of you. Don't do it so that people are going to praise you. Don't do it so that people are going to think you're holy, you know, so that you look holy. And in using some of the exaggerated imagery that he does, you know, like sounding trumpets and praying on street corners, he gets at the heart of what these disciplines are really supposed to be about, and that's you and God. It's about you and your relationship with God. You know, it's not about keeping up the appearance of having your relationship. He says, there's no benefit in that. You know, you've already received your reward because people think you've got, you know, a relationship with God. No benefit in that. And it's also not about checking boxes. You know, it's not about saying, you know, I, I spent my 15 minutes in prayer today. Check. You know, I threw money in the offering plate today. Check. You know, it's not, it's not about that either. What God is looking for, God's looking for the real deal. And God rewards a real, authentic relationship. And so I'd really today like to spend the rest of our time, most of the rest of our time, looking at prayer in particular, because if you look at the whole Sermon on the Mount, what we find is that Jesus' teaching on prayer is at the very center. And so that's a reason for us to take notice. But I don't want to overlook the other two disciplines of, of giving and fasting, because those are important and beneficial as well. And I want to just say something briefly about how they will strengthen our faith if we faithfully practice them over time. Now, Jesus knew that there is no other thing in the world, no other person in the world that competes for our devotion to God more than money. It's the greatest competitor for our devotion to God. And 2,000 years ago, he knew this. He said, no one can serve two masters. You, know, no one can, you can't serve both God and wealth. And so we take money and we seek after it for our security. We seek it for our happiness. Sometimes what money can buy us even becomes the thing that's driving us, the purpose behind why we're living. And so when we give a percentage of our money to God, you know, when we make up our minds to give whatever percent we decide with God, you know, the tithe is a, a model and something to aim for, but if we've never done that, you, know, you start with something. And when we do that, and we save some, and then we live on the rest of that, what we're doing is we're saying to God, God, I want you to be first in my life. And the other thing we're doing is we're saying, God, I'm trusting you to provide for me, to provide the rest. And when we see God provide over and over and over again, isn't that going to strengthen our faith? And fasting, fasting is interesting because when we fast from things like food or television or something that we can gain access to so easily in our consumer-driven, our instant gratification-oriented culture, what God does is God teaches us through personal experience that it's true, we do not live by bread alone. We don't live by material goods alone. And so... One of the things that Andy Stanley does um, in this, if you're in a study group or following along with us, he suggests that the resource that is perhaps second um, to money, that we value right up there and might even rival money for some of us, is time. And that's where prayer or a personal devotional time comes in. Now, some of us are so busy that we can't really imagine putting anything else in our schedules. We cannot possibly pack anything else in there. We are going, 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 going. And I know as I'm sitting there, you can like, your heart rate's rising and you're like, I know, because um, you've got somewhere to be after this. Um, but what happens with our calendars, it's just like money. By looking at how we spend our money, you can often tell a lot about what our priorities are, what are the things we value. And our calendars are really not that much different. What makes it onto our calendar and what doesn't 
is often a good indicator of what's important to us. And if you're sitting there thinking, gosh, you know, like, these things are really important to me and I don't find time in my calendar, then maybe that's an indication that something needs to change. You know, just think about that. Um, but if you have kids, your kids should be on your calendar. And I don't mean, like, driving them places, because I know you guys do a lot of that. Um, I can't wait. Um, but, and that's not like a, you know, there's no subliminal message or whatever there. Because um, watch, I know how the rumors go at church. Um, but anyway, if, you're, if you've got kids, they should be on your calendar. Time with them should be on your calendar. If you're married, your spouse should be on your calendar. Time with your spouse. If you're single, your friends, your family members, the people who mean the most to you, they should get time in your week. And Dan and I quickly discovered when we were married that if we did not schedule a date night, with us both working at two different churches, we could be like ships passing in the night. You know, and we might go you know, a couple weeks without seeing each other if we were not disciplined about keeping one another and, and that time together on our calendar. So we, we discover when we aren't as disciplined about that is that we can fall into superficial or surface level relationships with the people that we love and care about without even realizing it. And so, you know, we all know what a superficial relationship looks like, right? I mean, you've got so social media, you, you've got some, right? It's like, it's unavoidable. But it's possible to have superficial or surface level relationships with people that you spend a lot of time with, people you see all the time, like your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends at school. That's very possible. And you know, it's even possible to have a superficial relationship with your parents or your kids. It's even possible to have a surface level relationship with your spouse. And actually, it's even possible to have a surface level relationship with God. And we talk a lot about the importance of a relationship, having that relationship with God, but it's possible to have that relationship and still be missing out on what it looks like to have a strong, thriving, authentic relationship with God. And the key to a healthy, thriving, authentic relationship is quality time. You know, it's not time, because we already talked about how you can spend a lot of time with people and still not really know them in a, with any level of depth. It's not time, it's quality time. And so that's in large part why I think that Jesus said in his instruction on prayer, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. I don't think he was just trying to tell us, you know, don't do it for appearance sake, because he could have given us any other number of ways to pray so that we weren't doing it for appearance sake. But I think in large part, he was also trying to tell us, go someplace and shut out the distractions. You've got a lot of distractions in your life. Shut out the distractions and give God your undivided attention. Make God a priority. Now, Jesus modeled this. It's, we see this all over the Gospels in Mark chapter 1. We see Jesus, he got, when it was still very early, but it was still dark, he got up and went to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Now, I'm, I'm not with Andy Stanley on this. I'm going to disagree with him, because I don't think that you have to pray the very moment that you wake up in the morning. Um, that's what he is recommending, but I am not a morning person, so if you got me out of bed, and I actually have done this, actually, I have done, gotten, prayed first thing in the morning, and if you are still falling back asleep while you are praying, is that quality time? <laughs> no. And it's probably also, though, it's probably also not quality time if you're doing it right before you go to bed. And probably not quality time if you're doing it late in the afternoon after you've already run here and there or had a bunch of meetings and you're mentally exhausted, if not physically exhausted. So, you know, you're out of steam by then. So that's probably not quality time either. So that time is probably somewhere early in the day. Maybe not the moment you jump out of bed and, you know, I'm not jumping. So, I don't know. But it's somewhere early in the day. And just like you would put your spouse or your kids or your friends or other loved ones on your calendar, Put that on your calendar. Make it a priority. 
make it non-negotiable. And see, when you do that, you, know, you don't have to do it for very long. You, know, if you start running, you don't run a marathon the first time you try to run because you would never do it again. Um, but start, you know, pick a number, 10 minutes. If that seems overwhelming to you, pick five minutes. But pick something and stick with it. And if you're saying, you know, well, what, what do I say? I don't really know. I've never done this before. What do I say? Well, you can listen because um, God does speak. And the other thing you can do is you can spend time with Scripture. Um, you can read the Sermon on the Mount. We've been talking about that a lot lately. And it's right after this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, the verses we skipped today, actually, because we talked about them two weeks ago, but Jesus gives some instruction on how to pray. And it's where he gives us a model for prayer when he gives us the Lord's Prayer. And Pastor Matt preached about this two weeks ago, and so I'm not going to go into all of that. But basically, what he said was, Jesus was not intending to give us a prayer to recite. He was giving us a way to structure our prayers. And so if you want to see the full thing two weeks ago, go to the new website. Uh, it's uh, the two weeks ago sermon, and it's 1326 is where he starts talking about it. So you got it? You don't have to watch the first 13 minutes. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway... <laughs> One of the things, though, we learned from that, though, is that when we go to pray, we don't go to pray to God and say, God, give us this day our daily bread. We pray what that means. And what that means is, God, give me the things that I need for today. Give me shelter. Give me food. Give me adequate clothing. Give me medical care. And what's happening when you do this is, you know, you're not simply rattling off a list. You know, God is not Santa Claus. You know, God knows what you need. God already knows. So, you know, what's happening when you're naming these things is that really you're saying to God, God, I'm not self-sufficient. I depend on you for these things. I trust you, and I'm coming to you and asking for these things. And imagine what were to happen to you and to your relationship with God if you got up every day and you spent 10 minutes on your knees and you prayed that prayer and acknowledged your dependence and your need for God. How would that change your relationship? How would that change your trust in God? Now, these disciplines, God uses them. God uses them to grow our faith. And my challenge for you today is to decide what you want. Because discipline, it's remembering what you want. Do you want the kind of faith in God, the kind of confidence in God, that when life storms come at you, you can still stand? And if your answer to that is yes, then make up your mind to do something about it. You know, don't wait until you feel like doing it. Because if it's like any of our other disciplines, if it's like flossing or exercising or any of those other things, we might be waiting a long time. So make up your mind and commit to doing it. Make God a priority on your calendar. Make God a priority in your life. Make God a priority in your personal finances and watch God work. Because I, I know that what you'll find is that God will use that to strengthen and to build your trust in him. Amen? Amen.